Okay, so my talk is on optimizing the Mandelbrot set for the HP Prime. I will have to come over here a whole lot. Okay, so the Mandel, the Mandel what? Okay, so the Mandelbrot set is a function in the compact, complex plane. You compute z of n plus 1 equals z of n plus c, where z0 is 0. You keep computing this until, uh, until z of n starts to grow without bound which really boils down to whether the absolute value is greater than two. Uh, you then plot the value of n on the complex plane, and it is typically colored. So you, you plot you know, one color for one value. Um, if it is in the set, if it continues to go after some, some bounding number, if n gets bigger than, say, 64, I think that's what's used here for this one, um, then you typically color that black. And then the others you color based on how, um, where n started to escape. And the border of this thing is fractal. Well, what, what if you didn't consider color? It wouldn't be a complex plane then? Well, it's still in the complex plane, but you would probably just color the, the black part and then just a single color for the rest of it. Okay, so um, the points in, the, in n are colored black. Like I said, for fun, we color the outside of the border using, uh, using colors. Um, and the value n is, is usually called the potential. So I'll, I'll use that phrase further, uh, further on here. And like I said, uh, the, the point is outside of m if the absolute value is greater than 2. I don't remember the math for that, but um, you can basically prove that. All right, Mandel who? We talked about Mandel what? This is Mandel who? This is Benoit Mandelbrot. Does that sound like I'm pronouncing it right? Benoit? Benoit Mandelbrot. Mandelbrot or Mandelbro? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, he died in 2010, unfortunately. He studied this set in the, uh, uh, starting in the early 80s. He invented the term fractal, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, this is from the, uh, the, the, the data there, and, uh, and the picture are from the Wikipedia site. Okay, a little history of this program. I started this in the late 80s, uh, a DOS shareware program called MSET, written on a 286. Um, you might be able to still find that. It was on the Nighthawk shareware disk, so that's sort of the most popular place that it's found itself to. In the 90s, I kept thinking to myself, I really should port this to Windows. And, and then in the 2000s, I thought I really should port this to Windows, but I was busy raising kids. And then in the 2010s, I'd completely forgotten about it. I was just busy raising kids. And then now about, uh, I don't know, six months ago or so, I thought, you know, this would be kind of a cool talk for HHC. So, so I set about trying to port it. I could, except I'm using my Never mind. computer. Um, so the code to compute the potential is, is really simple. Here's the uh, PPL code. Um, you set local C and Z and all that and uh, convert, let's see, uh, you convert the pixel coordinates, right? You're given the pixel coordinates, you convert them to the actual um, point on the, the, the complex plane. You run through a loop. Computing the thing, if the absolute value is greater than 2, you return the result. Otherwise, if you make it all the way to the maximum iteration limit that you set, you return that value. And the fact, oh, yeah, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, because of the, the math involved is what takes so long. The math involved is what takes so long, exactly. <laughs> this is hard to compute. I mean, in, certainly in the 1980s, this is very difficult to compute because the math just takes forever. Okay, so, um, so let's talk about how to optimize this thing. Well, the first version, you just do it, right? You just walk through, you walk through from, from left to right, top to bottom, compute the potential, turn on the appropriate pixel, boom, you're done. So let's um, pop out of that and we will show this here. And I can probably Enter the naive algorithm, and there it is. So doody doody do runs through, computes it, does it in you know a few seconds. Technology for you. There's the technology for you exactly. Go from the current slide. Is that up? Okay. So um, that's nice, and but it's kind of slow. And back in 1988, you know that would take all night to, to run that. 
So the first thing I, I did was I thought, all right, we'll do this with integers instead of floating point, because integer math is faster than floating point. 64-bit prime integers, fabulous. The only problem is you're going to do fixed. So this is going to be fixed point with integers. So I put 35 bits to the left of the radix point, 29 to the right. You basically sort of decide this is what you're going to interpret that integer as. Um, addition and subtraction, you just do it. Multiplication, you have to worry about overflow. And of course, after you multiply, you have to adjust the result down by however many bits to. It's, it's just like multiplying um, decimal digit numbers, right? You multiply the numbers, and then you have to move the decimal point, however many were to the, the right, I guess it is. OK. So you run that. Next slide. And um, I did, did some testing. The floating point time was 132. The fixed point time was 129. Practically no difference at all. Well, what happened? Because this was a huge improvement in, in the 80s. Um, well, one reason is that floating point has gotten a whole lot faster than it was in 1988. Um, anything mm -hmm. in particular running on that 286? Anybody? Anybody? No? 287. I didn't have a 287. Uh, right. The floating point was done in software on my original PC. I had to, I think I, one of the first things I did was I bought a 287, the coprocessor that came with it. Those floating point instructions were not in the original. Uh, PCs until the Pentium, maybe? No, no, the 486DX. 486 yeah. 486DX, right, right. The 486, right. SX had a, had a 487SX, right, right. Um, another thing is I think the overhead on the prime is fairly large compared to the computation, maybe. So actually just like the act of going through the loop and whatnot and interpreting the data may be fast, maybe longer than, than doing the computations. Um, so for the rest of these algorithms, I'm going to use the floating point version because it's slightly higher accuracy. Okay, next one. All right, so, well, the integer stuff didn't work. So let's think about something big. What, what can we do that's like really going to cut down on the computation here? And for that, we'll take a step back and think, what's the goal? What are we actually trying to do here? Next. All right, are we trying to accurately compute the Mandelbrot set? for academic calculations? I don't think so. We are trying to generate pretty pictures, <laughs> right? OK, so can we skip some of the computations? Because we're not interested in 100% accuracy. We're just interested in does it look cool. All right, and so this comes to the color guessing algorithm. This is recursive. Uh, recursive algorithm basically means you divide it into smaller and smaller problems that look the same. And, and hey, that's kind of a fractal thing, isn't it? Maybe we should call that a fractal algorithm. So what I'm going to do for the recursive algorithm is start with four corners of a rectangle. Here, 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 and here. I'll compute the potential for those. Next. I'll then compute the potential for these additional points. North, I had to name them something. So north, south, east, west, and central. And you can see here, this one is obviously different from the others, but the other colors, can't quite see it on the projector, but they're all slightly different. Um, if those values are all the same on all of those, we'll fill it in, we're done. Don't, don't bother computing the rest of what's on the inside. Poof, you're done. Uh, next, if they are different anywhere, then we'll recurse. We'll do the bottom one here. Same thing, fill in these, 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 and these. See if they're the same. If they aren't, we'll keep going down and down and down and down. So we'll do this one, and then I think it's this one, then this one, then this one. OK, let's watch that in Watch action. Lower. <laughs> yep, and that actually turned out to be slower. Uh, let's see, we'll go here, and we'll do three. And there it goes. And you can kind of see how it's doing, you know, working its way from, from bottom left to top right all the way. And if you remembered about how fast that was before, you're probably looking at that and thinking, huh, it doesn't look so good, Dave. What's the deal here? And let me tell you, I was thinking the same thing. There it goes. Okay, so it's it's way slower, all right? So 
Now again, back in the 80s, this was a big deal. This, this did great. So what the heck is going on? All right, next. Okay, so the problem is when we compute the rectangle, as it gets small, we compute these tops, the, these points, the ones I mentioned. Next. But sometimes the rectangle doesn't look square. It looks like this. Right? So it's, it's sort of, it might be 2 by 3 or something like that. Next. And this point is both the top left and the north. And this is both mid and west. And this is bottom left and south. And we end up recomputing them. So we compute it twice. And it turns out we're computing the same point a whole lot over and over again. So uh, right, the next one, color guessing two, only compute north, south, east, and west if, uh, of the midpoints if you really have to. Next. All right, so color guessing one was 557. Color guessing two, hey, big difference. Came down to 192. So that's a big difference here, but it's still way slower. Remember, we're doing a lot less computation here. This should be much faster than the original. So all right, so now what's going on? Um, and another thing to, to think about, I showed the, the code to compute the, the first algorithm. It was just a for loop, and it, it called the thing. By this point, it's, it's probably like a couple hundred lines of code to do, to do these. This, this code is getting much, much bigger. OK, so um, what's going wrong here? Well, the problem is we're computing the interior sides twice. So let's look at the, the small rectangle here. I'm going to do this rectangle, right? And basically, the reason I'm doing that is because I've already computed, like if we look up here, I've already computed this, 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 and this. So I figured, all right, I'll just fill in, you know, I've computed that one, that one, that one, and that one. I'll fill in these five and then go from there. And that's great, except that when I come over and do this, I'm going to end up recomputing this point. And then when it gets smaller, I'll recompute the middle there and the middle there and the middle there. And the bottom line is I'll recompute the interior points, pretty much all of them twice. So next. So now we come to color guessing three. And the idea there is to truly divide the rectangle into four non-overlapping quadrants and do all the improvements from the others. And I'll give a demo of that one. And there it goes. And that, that looked a fair bit better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, whoops, wrong one. The, the timings that I'm giving, by the way, are for doing um, five of these in a, basically in a row. OK, next. Thanks, Joey. OK, so our timing again, we come down to color guessing 315. So it went from 192 to 115. That's faster than the floating point time, but really only a little bit. So. Something finally worked, but you know, it's just, it's just not the improvement that I was looking for. So in conclusion, not all optimizations work, right? This, in many ways, was intended to be a great talk about how to optimize code and the, the great improvements you can get. And it turned out to really just fall flat on its face. Um, each of these steps are things that I did 30 years ago, and they had huge improvements like I said, on, the, uh, on a PC. But on the Prime, forget it. Um, some things you can learn about, uh, about, about optimizing from this. Not all optimizations work. The integer math really surprised me that it didn't on, uh, on a real computer, at least back in the 80s, even with the floating point processor. There's a huge difference between integer math and floating point math. I don't know if that's still true today on a, you know, like on a, a PC or something like that. Um, maybe I'll give it a try. Uh, I still haven't ported this to Windows or, or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> yeah, it should. Now, if you're a 41 user, you'd get out to Saturn IR and make the capacitor size smaller so the, the, the process will run faster. <laughs> well, okay, so find the capacitor in the prime, and then we'll take a good turn. What, 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 what could go on? You have, you have chosen. I'm sorry? What 
what's the bailout value here? Oh, yeah, the bailout value. That's a very good question. Um, I'm computing it automatically based on essentially the magnification level. How, how far down am I going? And it goes up uh, logarithmically. Um, that, that's a value I just essentially stumbled upon, or an algorithm I stumbled upon from the, uh, when I did it originally. It starts, I think, at about 64 from the, the, the full thing that we saw at the beginning, and then it, it gets higher and higher as you go. Dave? Uh, back in the 1990s, when I was at B, uh, Gus A's company, and we had a computer with a B box, and it was running on twin power PC 603 processors. And we had a guy come in from France, I believe, and he was doing demo software and six power PC assembly. And one of his demo programs was a Mandelbrot Explorer. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea the algorithms he used. I didn't know it was all in assembly. Okay. And on an 800 by 600 pixel screen, he was getting about 10 frames a second. Wow. Zoom in and out and investigate parts of it. You know, you could see the frames that were still, yeah. you know, we were used to stuff going like this. Yep, yep. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, a vector processor would really help with this. Um, I'd love to do, is it CUDA? Is that the, the API for using a, um, um, a video? Yeah, yeah, a, a, a video card. Um, would probably let you explore it in real time. Um, solve the right problem. That's, that's another one. Um, making pictures is the goal, not mathematical exactness. And that insight led to the color guessing. Um, for those of you who are programmers, I cannot stress how important Solve the Right Problem is. It's the, some of the, the best things I've done in my career have essentially boiled down to Solve the Right Problem. Gunter. Have you had a look at my Mandelbrot Explorer that I published? Uh, is that the, for, for the Prime? Yes. Is that, yes. That's yours. Yeah, yeah. I took a look at that after, after so, running this. Yeah, very nice. And uh, I used the term, uh, I took it from FractInch. Uh -huh. You may know that yes. program from the 80s. Yes. Uh, solid gassing. Mm -hmm. What I did, uh, I think I first calculated uh, in the area of uh, 16 pixels, 4 by 4. Okay. And then I uh, looked at each uh, quadrant to its neighbors. Uh -huh. And when there was oh, the match, yeah. I, I considered it. Yep. Okay. Uh, no work, no further work. No for, yeah, yeah. So it's essentially the same, so kind, kind of the same algorithm. Python as such is yeah. incredibly faster yeah. than anything. If you're in interested, I have it here okay. with me on my, uh, on my calculator. Yeah. Yeah. And you can play around with sure. it, zooming in, yeah. and changing colors, yeah. changing the depths. Uh, nice. So. Yep, yep. Yeah, this, um, the program here, it's on your, your thumb drive. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward because I didn't really have a lot of time to, to make it nice. Um, you can zoom on it, just you know, use your finger to, to draw the corners of a, of a zoom box and you can zoom in. Um, you can't go back, unfortunately. I didn't have time to add that. Um, and really the goal of all this sort of thing is just have a good time. Um, you had a question back there? No, don't worry about it. Okay. That's it, Jake? Oh, cool. And, it, and, you know, Mandelbrot discussed how he had done it with punch, originally with punch cards and, you know, print out paper and, and whatnot. And he said, you know, okay, fractals have two properties, self-similarity and chaos. Yes. He went from there. Yep. So if the video, the audio didn't catch it, that was a, a video from the 80s called... Fractals and Animated Discussion. Fractals and Animated Discussion. And it's not right for Scientific American. I think that's it. If you press the button, is there anything else there? Um, yeah, references of vision is on there. I mentioned that, and that's it. Okay. Hold on. Thank you.